Hello, everyone, and welcome to a Tuesday edition of the MSP Initiative Live. Uh, so some general housekeeping that we usually do at the beginning of these, um, you know, just get it out of the way, and then we'll we'll jam in with a little bit of our guests and, and see where we go. So mspinitiative.com, under sessions, you'll see this session and every other session in both podcast and video format. So, um, you know, get caught up, rewind, fast forward, it's all here. Uh, stay tuned for our you know, MSP community block parties are coming up uh, on the back end of the year here. I promise they'll be exciting, but you'll see some of the past ones here on, on community block party tab. Stay tuned and you'll see what's happening. I promise. Lastly is our channel strong tour. Um, you know, this is, you know, we just completed one last week. We have another one coming up here in a few weeks. Uh, so we were just uh, finished like, you know, Midwest, we call it part two. And then uh, we're coming into the Northeast uh, June 27th through the 30th. So if you go to channelstrongtour.com, scroll down, you'll see the entire schedule for the whole year. Uh, looks like we're coming up on Reston, Virginia, Baltimore, Maryland, somewhere in South Jersey, and my stomping ground, Philadelphia. And then we give everybody a day off, travel day, for uh, Fourth of July weekend there. So love the Fourth of July. It's my favorite holiday. Anyway, uh, without any further ado, we'd love to introduce Derek and Michael from Fire Logic. Welcome, guys. Hi. Hello. Thanks for having us. Good afternoon. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for, first of all, super huge thank you for, I think for the third year in a row, helping us uh, with the Channel Strong Tour in Chicago. Uh, Chicago is a very big place with a lot of limited parking. So we appreciate you guys for helping us out. <laughs> Our pleasure. That was a challenge. Finding the venue and getting all that sorted um, was definitely interesting. Uh, yeah. I mean, it just, you oh. know. Any, any, anytime you're going into the a big city, right? I mean, parking is uh, <laughs> it's a little bit of a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I feel like, yeah. So, uh, so I really appreciate that. I, I didn't make it this time, but I heard it was awesome. I heard the weather was fantastic, was and uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. How was it? How'd you guys? How was it? Well, we really loved meeting up with uh, new new uh, people inside the channel. So not only do we have the conversations with Ken, who we talk to uh, every time we can, because we love his stories, uh, but also we got to meet some more MSPs in the Chicago area. It ends up being a good relationship builder too, because uh, we're about to put up on our social medias, thanks to everybody that did bring contributions for the uh, self-help pantry of displays. We are huge on giving them any help we can. They're like our patron uh, charity. We love working with them. Uh, we try to uh, work with them at least a couple times a year. We got a couple of their red bins uh, full of uh, non-perishable food, baby wipes they needed. They need really desperately. We're in All a critical stuff. Yeah. emergency yeah. situation on a lot of this stuff. And we also bring them back because they've got to dispense this stuff to their to their uh, to their uh, customers. So whatever we can do to help, we're always reaching out to do so. Derek's been great as our owner. He's been a person who's been a huge proponent of community outreach, be it helping the local library on free help desk on Saturday mornings to um, doing free classes at the local libraries. Um, it's really a big deal. And we're all conscientious about giving back to our community. So thanks to Derek. And it's been a pleasure in my four years here working and being able to not just be event in events like this, you know, we're, we're having a beer, chatting with a bunch of people, and um, but also being able to uh, give back to the people that need it, especially now more than yeah. ever. I mean, we're having some tough times, gas prices are where they shouldn't be, and um, there's a lot of needy people, and we're going to help a couple of them out with uh, yeah. people. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, you know, I don't know how, you know, like the next little while here you know gas prices don't seem to be going down and um we're starting to hear like food shortages right all of a sudden there's like all these factories like you know on fire uh and like all of a sudden they're like the supply chains just you know disrupted that way uh, i'm one of those uh sorry people that uh has a child that you know needed formula <laughs> so i know that's happening right now right so hey you know you know at least you can you know look around right but if you can't if you can't if you're stuck somewhere and you're you're needy right this is the whole purpose of giving back a little bit to the community so we're we're super thrilled i see pete popped in here in the chat and he said that uh 
Uh, he thinks that you got more this year than probably the last couple of years combined, which is awesome in terms of donations. So I, agree. I had to carry it into their <laughs> into their location, and uh, it was uh, it was a Bahamas. So, but they're so thankful. Uh, we're gonna put some stuff up, like I said, on uh, our Facebook and with pictures and thanking the folks who made the big contribution, who, who made contributions. Everybody I can thank uh, will be awesome. thanked. Yeah, it was but, great to I'm so excited. That's awesome. I, I really like that. That's a feel good. Definitely coming out of this. And, um, you know, other than the networking aspect of what General Strong is. So, you know, a little bit of a, a one two punch. Um, I don't you know, let's let's talk a little bit about FireLogic for a second. Right. I mean, you know, we obviously know you're based in Chicago, but I you know, I'd love to kind of, you know, set the foundation. Right. How you know, how did you get your company started? Like what's your target audience? You know, what's your size today? And then, like, we'll get into kind of some some current topics of the day. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit. Um, I started the business, honestly, just doing computer repair out of the condo bedroom. Um, and it's kind of funny looking back, you know, 12, uh, 12 years ago when I was uh, just getting everything going, uh, you know, doing repairs nights and weekends. I'm still actually doing a full time job. I was working for a high school district um, doing IT and training over there. And this was kind of a side hobby. So, you know, really got to the point where I got so busy. Uh, this being a hobby where you know, nights were taken up, my lunch breaks, I was doing client callbacks. I mean, it was just, you know, getting ridiculous. So, you know, the accountant, you know, one day said to me, Derek, you know, why don't you just make this a business? Honestly, you're so busy, you're making pretty good money, um, you know, as a side uh, gig. So that's, that's what I did. You know, I decided to leave that, um, leave that job in 2012. And um, this has been a full-time affair for me since then. And, um, you know, we went from, you know, condo bedroom office now to, we have our primary office in Des Plaines right outside Chicago. And we have our Chicago proper location um, that's on the brink of opening here within, you know, just a couple of weeks or so. So um, yeah, two locations, we're 11 people, um, you know, about eight technicians. The rest of that is obviously sales and um, a little bit of a administrative overhead, but um, we've we've come a long way. We just used to do um, computer repair and and you know break fix um, back in the day, and you know starting in about 2015 is when I started to make that transition um, to the MSP model. I knew that managed support was really the future for us, um, and we are still making that transition. I don't think you could ever get away from the break fix entirely, um, but we are looking within the next three years to make that a small minority of the kind of service that we do so you know managed it is our future and that's really where we're transitioning to uh, uh still to this day awesome so, so like what's uh how many customers would you say you manage today under that kind of you know kind of new blueprint that you've been running on and then like what's the typical customer size under that program yeah, I would say, I mean, our, our, our amount of clients that we have under our managed IT support model, probably today, if I had to put a pin it, Mike, probably put it at, uh, you know, between about, uh, you know, 25 or so uh, is, 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 is my guess um, right now. And again, average client size is hard to pin a finger on. We've got some clients that are as large as um, you know, close to 125 seats. We have some that are as small as a single person shop. So we really cross the gamut and spectrum in terms of verticals uh, and client sizes. I would say our sweet spot that we really like, that we really gel in terms of um, client size, I'd probably say is in that 20 to 30 seat range. That's okay. really- That's good to know. Just put on a kind of, put a, put a context around things. Exactly. So, so you know, uh, I can't go through a session without, uh, you know, talking about some of the, you know, previous stuff that's happening. So, you know, a lot of vendor movement in the space. What's your opinion about like some of the mergers and stuff like that? I know Dado and Kase are the one that everybody's still talking about. Like, how does that affect your business? And like, what do you, what do you see there? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, in, in some ways it's room for opportunity. You know, I'd like to see, I'm always kind of an optimistic thinker. I'd like to think that some of these moves are in the right direction for the right reasons. Uh, and going to be, you know, uh, giving the MSP community and providers like us 
you know, more chance to, to do more with the tools and services that we use day to day. Um, but I'm cautiously optimistic. You know, you, you see the things that, again, Datto is a big part of our stack right now. We use Autotask. We're on Datto RMM. Um, we use some of their backup products uh, still. We move a little bit of that to Axient um, as we've been, you know, slightly dissatisfied with some of the workstation offerings and reliability there. Um, but again, PSA, I mean, that's a big part of any MSP's primary stack. So hearing that Kaseya is the one that's taking that over, boy, really doesn't, uh, uh, you know, let me sleep, you know, super well at night. Um, but again, part of me says, let's see what happens. You know, Kaseya has been saying they're going to be hands off. They're going to let Dado be their own thing. I hope that's the case. I hope they uphold that promise um, because, you know, Kaseya is definitely not one of my uh, most loved firms. So I take a let's see what happens approach and uh, we'll make decisions and judgments from there. No, I, I get that. I mean, so why, you know, what, so you said, why Axiom, right? I mean, you said like some of the desktop, was it, you know, yeah, I mean, again, I, I think I think Zato's um, primary offerings and the Cirrus and Alto lines have been pretty solid. We've been pretty happy with them, but we've been seeing a lot more motion and movement in terms of the needs for uh, workstation backup for 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 endpoints that are out in remote uh, situations, either at clients' homes or for remote salespeople out in the field that don't touch the primary office. And that's where Cirrus and Alto really can't um, play any part of that stake. So Dato came out with, as most people that know the Dato stack know, um, their um, uh, cloud continuity product that is meant for workstation backup that gives you image-based um, backup for files and the whole system image uh, for Windows workstations. And that was, I mean, gosh, they were, that was the big hubra uh, at the last live data kind we were at. I think that was 2019, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and we're out a couple of years later and just, a, you know, a lot of issues. And we had actually a couple scenarios. I got a client in mind that we tried to do a live restore on um, using a cloud continuity um, backup image. And we ran into speed issues and issues with the, the image not deploying properly on a uh, non-like hardware system. And, and that was kind of my eye opener to kind of kick the tires a little further and inspect that data product. And, and after talking with support, even they were saying, well, this is kind of half-baked. This is still an item we're still fixing. This is on the roadmap from being done. And we're like, guys, you know, this is the stance you're taking when you at DattoCon 2019 said this product's ready for prime time. You know, how can we sit and believe you? We already had one egg on our face situation. So, so that was kind of the chance we took to look at other products. And Axiant was one that our engineers really liked. And uh, we're moving more and more business away from Datto Cirrus and Datto Alto. And obviously on the workstation side, I think we've converted all of our workstations to be on the Axiant um, product. And my guys are happy that the product's working as it's supposed to. And the price point is you know, knock on wood, it's actually quite a bit better than what Data was extending us. So um, part of me feels Data was getting kind of relaxing on their laurels a little too much and thinking everyone's going to be along for the ride because they trust the, the Cirrus and Alto lines. Um, but this cloud continuity has been nothing but, you know, kind of a mess. Uh, wow. For, so, right. so like your experience with Axion, I mean, obviously the product has to work, it seems like, and the price is good. Yeah. How's the support? Uh, support's been good. Yeah, our engineers, um, especially our primary engineer that's in charge of all of our uh, backup products uh, and our server fleet, uh, he's been working with the uh, Axiom support and, and he's been pleased. They've been treating us well. Um, onboarding was good and, and everything we've asked for after that has been really good. And again, I feel it's, you know, again, Axiom knows they're the underdog and they're definitely trying from a pricing perspective, from a support perspective, and from a features perspective. So until something changes, you know, that's really our new direction. Um, when it comes to uh, BCDR for the workstation and server side. That's awesome. So I'm to that too. What, what um, a couple of points like to, to expand on what Derek's saying. Uh, business continuity is one of the biggest thrusts of our, our agreements. We can't have a situation where we where we fall or where we where we're not a hundred percent. So this is where it's extraordinarily important. I mean, it's it's one of the things that people are paying us for. We can't yeah. we can't not meet that. Talking about Kaseya and Datto, one of the things that kind of ties in with this is is that as a Kaseya buys Datto and, or or is slated to, some of the people that are on Datto's current uh, employee are going to move out and do new things. So guy like Eric Torres moves to another organization. We're going to follow where he goes. 
We're going to hear, you know, anytime somebody that was one of the innovators with data was going to be going to another operation. Somebody like Axiom is a growth, you know, from us finding from the big guys to finding something that's a little more niche, a little more niche, and a little more um, fitting what we needed. So we're looking for the, the situation like that will come out of this. We'll see some of the folks that were doing really great things for data maybe go out on their own, start something new that's maybe competitive or does fit some another, another potential need. So there could be some really great things that come out of this, not just, you know, as much as it might be a downside, the commoditization of, da of data's offerings, even though the rumors are that everything's going to be status quo and they're going to let people go as they've been going, but we'll see if there's some more innovation coming out of it too. So no, that, that's fair. So you kind of, kind of leaned on the idea that he's like, Hey, you, you seems like, Hey, if you invest in a product, it has to work. There has to be support. It has to, you know, there has to be like a good, you know, kind of track record with it, but it seems like the people are very important to you too. Right. So, you know, how important is the actual people that you're working with at the company you know, in reference, you know, in balance to the actual product itself. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll speak to that. You know, definitely, uh, you, you know, I think when it comes down to it, the proof is in the pudding, right? I think the solution has to be solid. The support's got to be solid. Um, I think the people aspect definitely plays a large part of it. Um, but, you know, going Part of back to what I was, uh, you know, mentioning earlier, a firm like Datto, you know, again, we we and just kind of at face value and trusted that a product that comes from Datto, when we know what Cirrus is um, known for, um, we expected something to be, you know, solid and meet that same level of reliability. And when you get something that's kind of a stinker, you know, it kind of makes you question, you know, who's in charge? What's going on on the leadership side? What's going on on the management side? Uh, you know, makes you question things. So that's kind of why we've gone a little bit of a direction of, hey, kicking the tires a little bit and testing the waters of saying, hey, you know, we've been on ESET for so many years. We've been on Datto for so many years. Is it time to kind of rethink some of those relationships? And especially when you've got situations like a Kaseya or these mergers happening or acquisitions, um, you know, you really just get your guard up a little bit and start questioning a little bit further. Hey, is this the shift we want to be on for the next year, three years, five years? And that's some of what we've been doing internally. And, and you know, again, I mentioned the backup side, but um, we made a transition as well. George from uh, uh, ESET. We were on ESET partner for what, uh, over eight years. Um, and just recently, we're actually in the midst of completing a transition over to Sophos and their cloud managed um, MTR, uh, uh, a threat solution suite. Um, and we've been very happy with that. So uh, again, you know, you get too comfortable sometimes with a product or solution just because you like a couple of things in their stack or you like some of the people in their stack. But you, you, in our industry, you've got to be be willing to keep testing, keep trying and keep your eyes and ears out because someone's gonna bound to overtake one of those solution stacks and it could be anybody. It doesn't have to be the big dog anymore. And that's something that we've really found out, um, especially in the last few years so, as this oh, yeah. continues to mold yeah. change. Agree hundred percent, which, which brings a good question, which is, you know, like now that, you know, a lot of people are, are, are kind of in this hybrid space, right? I mean, you know, like there's still kind of a slow, you know, cloud, cloud, cloud for like 10 years, but there's still kind of a very slow adoption, right? Of totally virtual cloud servers and workspaces and virtual PCs and stuff like that, right? I mean, you know, I feel like everyone's like, oh yeah, like half the people have already moved to the cloud. And it's like, yeah, some of the stuff's there, mm -hmm. but like, is everything there? No, a lot of people, the answer is absolutely not. Not everything's there. So th there definitely is a leaning there, right? I still think that there's a complexity towards pricing things, you know, like that run in, you know, in the cloud hundred percent. So how are you approaching that? And then obviously that I assume changes your backup strategy too, right? Your continuity strategy, because there's nothing, you know, if there's nothing premise based, it's all, you know, just a, a window into the cloud, then obviously it's a different approach. Yeah. So in terms of the backup side of that, uh, you know, really, I mean, it, it, it changes your thinking again, you know, when you're used to the whole on-premise side of things and, and knowing that you're rolling out, you know, workstation agents or server agents, and now it's shifted to, you know, our, one of our big things. I mean, gosh, almost every proposal we're putting out in the last half year, Mike, 
has had some form of SaaS backup on it, right? Is that not, not true? Um, so SaaS backup has become a really big thing for us, whether it's on the Google side or on the Microsoft 365 side. I mean, I think that's almost a standard offering that we're doing now because of how prevalent, um, you know, it, it doesn't have to be where your whole cloud infrastructure is in the cloud. Even if you have your major pieces of your cloud storage, your email, your Teams, I mean, all that needs a backup strategy. So I think SaaS backup has become something, especially in the last, uh, I would say, year and a half or so, two years, um, that we've really become keen on and been including as almost a standard offering uh, this day and age. Awesome. Awesome. Have you have you dealt, have you dabbled in like totally cloud, like Azure or AWS, Google Compute, something like that? Or is that really not, you know, been a focal point yet? Um, we don't do as much with AWS or um, Google's um, uh, cloud-hosted server offering, but Azure is actually something that um, we've been doing more and more of. We've got one Azure project that we're on the brink of deploying right now for a uh, 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 office server that was just fully on-prem, and, and the client uh, really had a directive uh, on the business side and on a requirement side that they wanted that um, that server environment to be right, uh, you know, within some kind of cloud provider. We found that Azure was the route to go. Um, and we engaged, uh, you know, services of Pax8 to assist us with that. And uh, I think they're going live. I just was on a status call this morning. They're going live this weekend on that. And my engineers are actually really happy with what they've been seeing from a feature and a functionality perspective on Azure. We're th we think we're going to be doing a lot more with that. And I think that may be our primary go-to um, uh, cloud offering for uh, server needs and hosting um, probably for the foreseeable future. So we we've been awesome. impressed. Awesome. Awesome. That's great news. So, I mean, it's obviously Sophos is a big part of your security strategy. Um, you know, I know that's a hot topic, right? I feel like that's the burning thing these days. So like, what are you seeing out there in your client base, right? Are they open to the idea of this? Has the cybersecurity insurance policy really started to get them questioning things? Or, you know, how's that dialogue going? <sighs> I would say I'm going to use an example that we're knee deep in right now. We've got a client that, you know, has just wanted to use our services uh, for the longest time, just on an as needed, you know, kind of 10,000 foot level. We'll call you when we need you. And it was actually funny. They, they, they um, had an opportunity to get a really big deal with a new client. Um, I'm not going to name any names, but they had a big opportunity coming across the table. And actually what spurred them to come to the discussion table with us and talk about going properly on a managed IT plan, full security, full compliance, HIPAA and PCI regulations being met um, is, is that they weren't able to land this deal because when they the client came back and and they had actually a questionnaire that that was uh, given to them and they weren't able to meet most of the security requirements compliance requirements uh, that were being asked of them and the client said once you got your stuff together and not so many words once you get your act together we'll reconsider you so <laughs> so that was really what spurred you know a big conversation between the client and our side of hey the way we've been doing things our status quo is just not cutting it. We're losing business now because of it. We need to rethink our strategy on how to do this. So they got in, involved with a, 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 a firm that's uh, helping them out with uh, from a HIPAA and PCI compliance perspective. Naturally, we're being brought in on the management side, on the rollout side, implementation, ongoing support, um, and configuration of all these systems. Sophos is a is a piece of that. Dark web scanning um, is a piece of that. Um, you know, DLP policies within the Office 365 and on the Sophos side are a piece of that. So uh, again, all wholesale transformation, you know, was kind of brought to the folk, brought to a focus um, just because uh, a very large dollar sum client uh, turned their back on them because they weren't secure enough. So that's a great, that's, that's the story right there. Right. I mean, if it's not the, like a lot of it's been the insurance focus thing, right. Where they've just said, Hey, we're either increasing your premium to like 300% or by the way, we're just not covering you go find something else. This is the other side, right? This is actually where you're not you're losing revenue. Like, Hey, we like you. We think you can do the job, but like you need to do this or we can't, we can't talk to you. So that's very interesting. I'm sure that's going to be depending on which verticals these people will be dealing with. It's got to flow downhill. Right. Uh, I had somebody remind me recently of, uh, it's been several years now, but uh, Home Depot had a data breach. 
-hmm. And they like, they eventually trace it back to like an HVAC contractor that was logging into their system at like one location. And they were like, you know, like it just takes one person. Right. I'm sure things have changed since then, but like, you know, like that, that just blows my mind. Right. Cause like you finally do all the work to get in, you, you get access, you do your thing. You're like, what is running a pipe or a vent have to do with cybersecurity, but apparently it does. Always your weakest link. And that's, and that's actually part of the reason that we're employing another uh, relatively new vendor in our stack, a uh, company by the firm of Nodeware. Um, you know, we evaluated a couple of firms. Qualys was part of that conversation. Um, but we, we really liked what Nodeware had to offer in terms of um, the ongoing vulnerability scanning, um, being able to scour the whole network on either an agent-based or on a uh, endpoint-based uh, uh, basis where you actually got a de dedicated device that's scanning everything that's on that um, on that subnet, so that's something that we are um, actively deploying for them. Uh, so again, from every angle of the ship, we are tightening up what's going on there. So the next time that they're asked, "Hey, are you meeting all these different things that we require of our uh, various vendors?" You know, we want those answers to be a yes instead of a "We'll get back to you." So yes, we'll get back to you. The famous line of every IT yeah. of every IT person, right? Uh, but hey, you know, better. Better to have the right information than not. Um, so, well, you mentioned yeah. talking about like how people have responded to it. Our clients are so busy with uh, what they're doing that they're just relying on us for us giving them the feedback. Sophos is what we're trusting. So, our transition has been extremely smooth because we have that cachet with our clients. They're just saying, if this is the route you're going to choose and it's going to keep us secure please go ahead and do it. We've gotten so many blank checks to save Mike make implement it. You understand? Before. Yeah. Yeah. See, it, it just, it seems like, like go back to 2019 for a second. Right. And like 2019 was a pretty good year for, ever, for I would say for most people uh, that all, all cylinders were firing uh, pre pandemic, even then, right. We're still at the beginning part of like some of this stuff, right. On the security front and that kind of stuff. You know, like fast forward now, it's it's like the conversation's been reversed, right? You're not necessarily going to them as much. They're now coming to you saying, hey, what what do you got for me here? I need something. And then it's like, oh, okay, well, it's interesting. I meant to be, I meant to talk to you about this. But yeah, let's have that conversation now. And that's pretty cool. We love it. And that's that's been one of the greatest, uh, one of the greatest methods of customers coming into us has been what what do I need? I need to be protected. Also, situations where people are going to need to have their compliance, uh, their compliance helped out with, and the amount of times we've helped with cyber insurance questionnaires. So yeah, it's been great. Just a little bit easier on the salesperson side, just having uh, customers coming to us rather than having to pound the pavement, go through RFP lists, or do a lot of the um, the digging for clients that we'd have to do. So. It's it's uh, it's definitely been a R R RFPs, man. Let's talk about that for two seconds. That's uh, you actually get business from RFPs. I, I I rarely, very few people I walk into say that that actually works. What was the last time we we went into an RFP? We put oh, so much oh, time and effort. I was about what two and a half, three years ago. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was kind of a downer. So I, again, I, if you've got the staffing, you've got you know people dedicated that can spend some time and actually you know do them properly. I think there's money to be made. And I know you know some colleagues that do do it, um, and it is you know relatively successful. But you've got to have the hours in a day, the hours in a week to be able to sit down, answer them properly, fill them out right, because you know again, if you're not getting your foot in the door to be a part of those um, proposal meetings. You know, it's all for naught. So yeah, uh, you know, I can day, imagine <laughs> 40, 50 hours on a on an RFP, and then. Yeah, but uh, again, we've got we've we've just we're in a position now where we've got so much referral business coming in, and between that and some organic um, search uh, uh, clientele uh, that's coming to us, we're you know, luckily we're just not in a position where we have to be out there hunting like that. So um, it's, a great, it's a great that's a great position to be in, right? <laughs> is is in a good position? You know, if well, you're not. You don't have good clients like that referring you out and you have new business coming in, uh, you may be doing something wrong because there's plenty of work, even in saturated markets like Chicago, plenty of work. I mean, we are nonstop new client meetings, you know, week after week. So two offices reflects the fact that we're going to end up uh, having to have boots in the ground a couple of um, less than miles away, less than a mile away from the new office because there's amount of people growing in the city. There's the amount of businesses 
that are either having their needs not met by someone else, and we're perfectly happy to step in. And let, let me ask you, let me ask you this: since you're doing a lot of new client meetings, it seems. How many people, from a perspective for prospects, right? Are you walking into right, and they have ne- they're not actually engaged with another ser- IT services provider, or MSP, right? They're just coming in saying, "Hey, we kind of been doing a little bit here, a little bit there, and we're looking for somebody." Because we don't have someone versus uh, with some money now and, you know, it's not great. And I got these problems and what can you do to make my situation better? What, what, what would you say the percentage breakdown is? My, what my do you reaction is 50, 50. I was just going to say the same. It's about half and half because uh, the situations where there was like an on site guy that was handling everything, but they just did not have anywhere near the expertise necessitated to be able to move that business forward. Uh, that's been a huge percentage just fresh in my mind, but there's also that uh, the amount of our soon-to-be uh, our soon-to-be partners that we've been working on for, with a couple months has had a had an IT service provider uh, IT service provider for the last five years that's just not getting done. I mean, if they got too big and then they're not having that personalized care or that on-site. That's that's where there's a lot of fertile ground for us to be going into. Or even just yesterday, right? There was an internal guy. I mean, we're trying to read the tea leaves here, figure out what's going on. But internal guy that was playing the role of IT, and he was kind of in a position saying, uh, you know, hey, I either offload this onto somebody else, or I'm going to leave the firm, yeah. right? So we we were kind of brought in in this you know semi emergency situation because this guy was so unhappy with having to take on all the IT tasks he wants to go back to his primary duties and he was just more and more and more in terms of security and managing backups and managing you know dual internet lines and firewalls not working and it just became too much so we're kind of swooping in to now fill that role of fractional IT department for them and it sounds like this guy this person is going to stay on board with the firm do what he came on to actually do instead of playing the role um, of IT guy so we a lot of different situations that you run into in this it's, it's, it's amazing right like for the longest time i'd say like let's maybe say five eight ten years mm-hmm. a lot of talking heads out there said and anybody who needs an msp already has an msp yeah. the only way you're getting msp business is if you're taking it for another msp and i'm like that doesn't sound right and like fast forward now all this time later half of your business are people who weren't even in, worked weren't even working with anyone they're coming to you like kind of kind of fresh right yeah. and then the other half right how many businesses especially like the pandemic's not that far behind us mm-hmm. I, I think it's over take that's my opinion <laughs> uh we're, we're not that far behind the pandemic and like these people who are doing it internally who's like a lot of people got cut during you know pandemic times right like they just couldn't do it or they, they didn't have the, the the business for them but then now post that right these internal people that either backed into these roles right or like literally just doing it because they're the only one right office manager whatever like they're not you know they're, they were never you know they're, they're, they're duct taping band-aiding and bubble gumming right i mean that's really what it is which makes it very interesting when you walk into those situations there's got to be a little bit of a cleanup process there because it can't be Absolutely. the way that you want to see it well, anytime we walk in on these you know we can ask simple questions like you know what's your backup policy you know where are your backups going to um you know how are we going how are we managing patching on workstations and, and a lot of times it's just blank stares it's like i, I didn't even know that was a thing so yeah. you know, the conversations, the baselines that we're walking into um, of what's being done and considered upkeep that was being done at some of these organizations, I mean, we're coming from stone ages sometimes. So absolutely, yeah. there's tons of business out there. There's so many organizations, not only where you have internal people trying to play IT person and they're doing a half decent job at it at best, uh, but also think about all the, the growth and, and, and opportunity that has come uh, about in the last you know one year of the economic rebound, George. Uh, again, all these businesses that uh, you know went up into, into turtle mode uh, at, during the pandemic, and now it's like uh, you know there's more positions than can be filled with people. All these projects that were on hold um, or paused um, during the virus era are now, everyone wants it yesterday. So Again, tons of opportunity, not only on the managed IT side, but on the project side and on firms that are just growing so quickly, adding so many staff. I mean, we got a, one client I'm thinking of in the healthcare space that, I mean, gosh, every single week we get new requests for new hires, what, two, three, four people a week 
at this point, we can't ship hardware out fast enough to them. I mean, well, well that, where, where are you getting the exception? Where are you getting your hardware from? That seems to be the problem for everybody. <laughs> you bring up a point that was actually one of the top of mind things that I would want to talk with peers on. We're, we found that we had to extend uh, the amount of distributors that we're working with. We've had, we've created relationships with so many. We've also, one of the things I came from was a state from was, was an experience of working on the uh, consumer electronics side where you had deals as employees, you had deals with organizations because you did a bulk of business with them. So that's something I've pursued is that we get deal regs with some of the, the uh, big vendors. And then we work with the distributors in order to get those executed. Fostering great relationships with salespeople has been invaluable. We have a great guy at Synex, a really great person, two great people working with us with uh, DNH. Our ASI rep uh, hits us up every once in a while, but we continue to, on the sidebar of kind of declining our business with them a little bit. But uh, so we're working with them. Ingram's not been as big of a mover with us. But uh, these are the, th this has really been the key for us with fulfilling all these customer needs is having multiple uh, routes to go channels, through yeah. and really building up good relationships with uh, the small business reps, the channel reps. It's helped us out so much. We're, we're finding that if we can't get the exact model uh, through one vendor, we'll go through another, but we're also able to substitute really well because there's so many different uh so many different choices to go through. Hey. And uh, that's been, like I said, that's well, really- Well, important. you know what? Well, why don't we take the opportunity, right? You said, hey, let's let's network with some of our peers. So we've got a couple of people, a few guys here and girls maybe uh, on the call. I'm gonna let everybody have a chance to unmute and chime in if you want, you know, for the rest of the call. Cause you know, kind of talk through some of these current event topics as well. Yeah. But uh, I know Darren, who's, you know, we, we, is like one of our, our top, you know, channel strong, uh, and uh, an MSP initiative uh, podcast guys. He just recently ran into Carbon Systems, uh, who uh, who apparently do hardware for the channel, right? Laptops, desktop servers, and like I just recently heard of Carbon, right? Like I just it was so funny because they just jumped on the last bus tour. I think they were up, you know, in Chicago possibly, and then. Darren last week said, oh, yeah, I just ordered something from them. And I was and I was going to take like a week to show up. And I was like, that's it. That's crazy. I guess, Darren, can you come yeah. up and just just curious what, what kind of you know, systems you're ordering from them? And uh, what's the experience been like? Well, we, we just ordered we just ordered a server for now, but we're going to also do some desktops. Um, and I mean, uh, and probably even some laptops, but we'll see. We're, we're just starting out. Uh, but I just, you know, I like the model and you know being able to get through and have actual support and we've worked with dell forever and you know we'll still work with dell but it's it's kind of become increasingly frustrating which we're, we're excited about uh you broke up a little bit there but sounds like you were with dell a little bit you're running in some shortages <clears throat> you you know you started you know, put in a test order with Carbon Systems. How long did it take? What, did, what was their turnaround on that server there? Uh, it hasn't I, we just ordered it last week, and I think, I think it's due in this week. So I'm, I'm not exactly right. sure, but it's a, it's much quicker than Dell. Dell's was 90 days. All right, so two week turnaround time. That's pretty good. Hopefully, the hardware is good, and hopefully, a good warranty. But that's fantastic. And what kind of su uh, support options do they offer, Darren, in terms of ongoing and uh, do they need five year, seven year on their parts? We we got a five year and we got a five year. I'm sorry, I have really poor signal where I am, guys. Let me try. Yeah, I think he's gonna drop and come back. See if he I'm has a better signal. You can also just type it in the chat too. Yeah, sounds like he did a five year, which is awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe that's an option, right? Check it out. I mean, I know a lot of people are, you know, whether they're Lenovo or Dell or HP, I mean, you know, obviously there's, there's off late name brand, but then you get into the problem with like warranty stuff, right? It's like, you know, just, you know, like, especially with people just buying stuff off the shelf retail, right? We all know how that goes, right? Especially when they buy the store warranty versus the manufacturer warranty. Walter chimes in in the chat and says, Dell overestimates delivery dates so that they can stay within the time frame. I ordered some hardware from Dell. It said a month and it came in a week. Many times, okay. I will say from our perspective, yes, that is the case many times, especially on servers. Um, however, what was that happened with the monitors? 
monitors were quoted within two weeks, Mike, and they turned it into a, what, 45 day, 30 day. So um, it, go, it goes both ways um, with Dell. So they, they haven't been um, perfect, but better than, better than some. So. Yeah, monitor is a frustrating situation because we continue to increase the amount that we're ordering. And that's something where um, being told that it's going to be coming by June 13th when the customer's ETA was uh, going to be May 20th, we can't we can't deal with that. So yeah. we, we went to another to one of the distributors. The distributor was like IoT in the middle of next week. We're like, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So 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 a couple couple you know chats here. So Tim Tolman, my my buddy over there in San Diego. Uh, he says that um, monitors are impossible, not just you. Uh, he said, I agree with Walter on servers on the overestimation date. And then uh, Pete chimes in and says, uh, Carbon has, has, has an awesome replacement policy. They actually send a direct replacement of the machine instead of the parts. And then you just send the old machine back, which is pretty neat. Oh, interesting. Yeah, we're yeah. going to take a look at them. I mean, Mike, you brought them up as being on the, the, the channel tour, and you're like, we got to look at these guys. Because um, you were mentioning them about laptops, right? Did they, they had let their laptop off? They're they? not only from an aesthetic standpoint, their stuff looks like the F-117 Stealth Fighter. If we're putting a 14-inch laptop in some of our customers' hands, and the magnesium uh, casing on that makes it so lightweight, I was impressed with it because the portability is increasingly an issue for our clients. The a client I was at this morning picking up his laptop. He specifically wanted a 17-inch uh, range laptop. The 16 that Carbon had would be something I'd be super comfortable in pitching because not only they put the specs in it, but the talk with the quality on that and the pricing, they seem to align pretty well. So I was impressed with Carbon, and it was great talking with them last week at, uh, at the Channel Strong stop. Uh, and it's something uh, just based on this conversation and having Derek here and about the good of it, it's something we'll be discussing a lot more in the real near future. That's awesome. Yeah. So uh, Creekor pops in, he said, rugged laptops from Dell, also impossible. Sure, they are specialized. Last two months, they've gotten pushed out another month. Yes. And Walter pops in and says, that makes us all look bad, right? When orders just disappear or get elongated. Yeah. Um, we got to put one in the 28 race car. <laughs> yeah, Pete's going to be rolling around with a laptop in his in, uh, in his passenger seat. Uh, Tim Tolman says, happening at Lenovo as well, not just Dell on the extended. Yeah, you know, Tim, it was interesting. Uh, I think I mentioned it uh, last week. Um, I had a need for a 4G built in, to, you know, to the laptop, right, where you can just pop in the SIM card. And uh, by just adding that one piece, that one you know chip effectively that gets put into the computer, that it turned into a four month lead time. And I'm like, for what? Yeah. <laughs> Probably the modem that they needed for for that was what was back ordered. So yeah, I was like, come on, guys, this is not hard. But uh, but anyway, uh, it, it very much interesting seeing what's happening on hardware. A couple of some current events that that are worth kind of popping into. So it looks like VMware, I'd love to know how many people are doing VMware stuff, uh, might be on the selling block. Broadcom, it's a name that's been in the technology space for a long, long time, uh, made a, might be potentially putting in an offer to buy it, right? And then we saw kind of like the deal, right? Like VMware and Dell were together, now they're apart, and now it could be VMware uh, and some of the VMware companies that have been acquired underneath of them might all be, might all be on the block. Uh, how much VMware are you doing? Uh, I mean, on our side, I, I would say VMware is probably a small minority of the systems, you know, that we're doing that need any kind of virtualization. Um, you know, our, our largest interfacing that we do with VMware, honestly, right now is probably with some of the um, VPC providers that we work with, like INAP. Um, they have a couple clients that use their solutions that are, you know, VMware based. So um, we write, you know, their stack, their managed stack of VMware. So not opposed to it. I have nothing, you know, not, nothing against it, but um, we've always been, you know, kind of a Hyper-V shop, uh, you know, from many years ago. And we tend to use that in the limited situations, honestly, today, where that's even necessary. So... All right. Well, that's interesting. That's good to know. Anyone else in VMware land? Uh, thoughts about this? Or is it just another another news note in the day and business as usual? Is VMware still part of Dell or did they already peel off? They technically are a separate company at this point. Dell still has shares in VMware, but they're not being operated underneath the Dell, the Dell umbrella. Interesting. Yeah. So 
I mean, hey, you know, everybody has like a little bit of different stack. I know VMware definitely was pushing their cloud offering to Amazon, right? You could do VMware on AWS. Mm -hmm. And then um, a lot of people uh, I know while uh, we're using VMware, obviously not just in-house, but also for their like kind of like desktop virtualization solution, right? Uh, I know that was actually, um, that's pretty popular in, in, in some of the larger companies, right? So I don't know. Just interesting that they're, um, you know, they're kind of being bounced around, right? Over the last three, four years, right? Out of Dell, in Dell, out of Dell, kind of like SonicWall, right? They're another one of those guys, like, you know, that uh, that got sucked into there. You know, they always say, right? Dell was a place where a lot of companies went to just flame out. But um, hey, you know, like you just kind of, kind of keep an eye on your uh, on your stack uh, and see what's going on. Um, so it looks like there are a bunch of announcements, obvious to you know, obviously be expected, coming up on the upcoming Microsoft uh, virtual conference. Uh, so um, a lot of a lot of conversation and additional feature set around Microsoft Teams. Um, I mean, obviously Teams is like just part of 365. If you're on like practically any SKU, you get it. Um, now you know, you know. NCE is still kind of happening. And then if you're on, get on the other side of NCE, you get the, you know, the dial in bridge, right? Kind of like that zoom ish type feature set for free, right? A $0 SKU, uh, or at least it is for now. So, you know, it's how, how popular is teams for you guys, right? Do you see, are you, are you doing a lot with it or is it just there? I would say it's it's definitely growing in popularity and use cases for our clients. Um, we've personally and internally been a team shop. I mean, I, we go way back. We were our phone system was on Link, for whoever remembers Link server. So oh, we yeah. had a Link shop, and we got converted to Skype for business. So we were on that for half a decade, and we moved over to Teams for our phone system and telephony and all internal chat and conferencing needs. Obviously, um, I mean, we've been on Teams now what for the last two years or so, two and a half years. Um, we like it. I think it's a good platform. Um, I'm sure we don't use it to the full extent that we probably could be using it. Uh, but again, it runs our full day-to-day -day phone system for all our technicians and, and support staff. Um, it's chat, it's conferencing for us, it's IM, it's um, pretty much everything that can't go into email or SharePoint and OneDrive goes in through Teams. So um, it's pretty pervasive for us. And, and we see this shift happening at a slower pace at a lot of our clients that we support. And Teams is actually becoming something that we're getting asked of, hey, we'd love to actually just ditch our desk phones and just move to a Teams phone system. So yeah. that's something that we've actually that's got a couple ongoing conversations on right now with uh, a couple of clients that want to go that route. So yeah. um, definitely growing uh, in terms yeah. of popularity. Um, I think it's always been there. I think they've always been neck and neck on, you know, against Zoom on the conferencing perspective. And I think they're a better platform than Zoom, honestly, in many, in many regards. Um, but in terms of the name recognition, I think in the last year, it's definitely increased a lot more than it was before where you said teams and people were like, what teams? Who's, who's team? <laughs> so Tim Tolan pops in. He's like, what phone system do they use? looks like they're probably just using the native calling plans, Tim, with, with, uh, with the team side. Right. Um, uh, with teams, we actually have a, um, a we are calling uh, our calling dial tone is provided by call tower. Um, okay. Voip company. So we've been with them for some time. We, she, cause we were using teams and phone system before Microsoft was offering though native dial plans. So that's why, you know, we went that route, just haven't unpeeled um, that onion. But um, again, who provides dial tone really isn't a big deal. We use phone system auto attendant through Teams. Everything's controlled through the 365 administrative dashboard. Um, so it's, it's it's fairly powerful. I, there's some things that we wish it had, like some more advanced um, uh, automation and scheduling in terms of after hours things. You know, that's a little clunky still. Um, but, you know, again, from my perspective, Microsoft is so invested in Teams and dumping so much money in R&D into it that I think they're going to be catching up with the big boys, the rings um, and players like that, um, you know, probably within the next year or two, if I had to guess. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll have to remember this episode and see if that's true. Um, so Walter pops back in on the VMware side. He said, again, VMware land, frowny face. He says, sadly, when Dell and VMware split, the Dell stock was, uh, was oh, valueless. Yeah. And then the VMware stock, I was shocked. You know, it's interesting <laughs> how the how the financial markets uh, react to this kind of stuff. Um, 
I mean, and, and let's face it, right? If anyone, I'm not, you know, if you're really paying attention to the stock market right now, uh, it's taken a bit of a beating. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, right for the last couple of months. So yeah, it's definitely not feeling good, and yeah, uh, really feeling the pain right now. Yeah, Walter says, "Buy, buy, buy, buy more." Exactly. Market sounds so. Yeah, pitch, pitch from Pete on some bvoip stuff, but we don't have to talk about that later. Um, so, um, it's very interesting to see, um, how everything pans out moving forward because. Um, you know, when we talk about, you know, the people who sell through the channel, right? The vendors who actually have a dedicated program or just literally just sell through, uh, you know, the channel for their, their main, you know, they don't have a direct sales force, right? Um, post, you know, let's say that the data can say a thing finishes, right? is behind us. Good amount of, the, you know, like the, 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 the landscape changes a little bit, right? Uh, and now all of a sudden, you know, there's really one or two bigger guys and then there's like a subset underneath of them. And then, you know, like, do you start to worry about, you know, any of the new vendors you're talking to and like what their plans are? Like, is this part of the dialogue of you interviewing new vendors and like, what's your game plan? Are you looking to sell the company? This type of, you know, that type, do you have any investment? That kind of thing. You know, it, it's definitely not one of our top factors that we're using uh, in these conversations, because again, I mean, who can sit here and foretell the future of who's going to get bought up and merged and acquired, you know, a year from now, um, you know, two years from now, I mean, that's anybody's guess, right? I think a lot of the people we deal with and departments we're dealing with in terms of on the solution side and support side, they're, you know, 10 degrees removed from anything that's going up on the management um, side of things. So we don't get in the weeds too far uh, in terms of that. But again, I, I think it's due diligence and prudent for us as MSPs to be watching some of the industry news, be aware of what kind of rumors are out there, who's going to be acquiring who is Kaseya, you know, you're going to be buying up and gobbling up any more, um, you know, uh, uh, platforms and solution stacks that we're looking at. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely something that's in the back of your mind. Um, but is it the topmost item that I'm considering when I'm comparing, uh, you know, security solutions or dark web providers um, or IT documentation systems? No. Right. Uh, it's one of those supporting factors that um, if I need to tip someone over the edge, you know, that may be it. If Kaseya is eyeballing someone and I'm tipping over the edge between two providers, I may go with the party that's not going to be Kaseya bound. So OK. All right. I, I, it's, it's I'm hearing you loud and clear. It's a question that's worth asking. Clearly, you don't you're not fond on the, <laughs> the Kaseya side. Yeah. Uh, well, which and you wouldn't be alone. Right. Based on some of the feedback we have on these calls. Um does your customer, like when you're, when you're pitching to your customer and this kind of brings me to my next thought, like when you like, do you pitch them a multi-year deal? Or are they on a year deal? Or are they on a month to month deal? Like how does that work? And then like that really dictates how you buy services from your vendors, right. To align with that. Yeah, I think our standard agreement uh, that we're going for, I mean, most of the managed opportunities that you're working with, Mike, right now are, are, are usually year-long deals, right? Um, if someone's looking to sweeten the financial side of things um, with us um, and, and going down that road, you know, again, we'll bring up the multi-year options. But, you know, again, I, I, I know how I feel as a um, buyer of services and being, you know, insinuated to lock in at three-year terms like Kaseya likes. And I know how that makes us feel. And I don't like pushing that on clients unless they're the ones coming to us and saying, hey, we're willing to go two years in, we're willing to go three years in, what can you do to sweeten that um, that that proposal up? That's when we start talking about it. So, um, you know, really one year, one year um, buy-in is really what we're looking for from clients. Because again, we want you doing business with us because you like us, not because you're married to us and can't divorce us fair so. fair no i mean listen it, it just it definitely is something that um it's definitely that's something that you have to pay attention to and you know listen the, the business model of hey you know like we do a good job and you pay us i mean that's kind of how things were right, for a long time right so like at the end of the day i think you know I think it's been proven, right? No matter what term you sign your customer to, if they want to, if they want to get out, they're going to fight to get out. Exactly. And that's a very uncomfortable situation. But when you run into things like, 
you know, NCE, for example, where Microsoft's like, hey, you're in a year. You got it. You're in for at least a year. Kind of aligns to what you're saying, but it could lopside the dates, right? You know, where you may be halfway through your one year, you know, deal with your customer, and then Microsoft kind of set their date. So, you know, yeah. that could get interesting. Cricor pops in and says, "I joined late. I see Fire Logic is tight with Microsoft and Surface, which I see on their website. Uh, what is your take on reselling Microsoft Surface equipment?" Well, Mike, what's What's well, been our position on? Well, I love Surface Duo, but I can't say anything as much good about the um, about the convertibles, the two and ones. We don't do very much unless it's specifically requested. We have had three clients in the last two years, going back to two years because it was about two years ago that the first one came along, where uh, factory floor requests were lined around the mobility. And we met their needs around Surface. We actually created a relationship with Microsoft uh, in order to partner up on getting a big bulk deal uh, and get pretty good pricing. Pricing, but uh, it's not our first choice. The challenge with it, as far as limitations with multi-monitor, uh, the repair issues have been ca catastrophic. We um, we had actually a customer completely leave using my using Surfaces just because the amount, of, well, I wouldn't say completely leave, but we've had problems where we could not get these things fixed. So we partner up with uh, LCD Screen uh, Repair, our, our organization that handles that for us, and they can't do anything with them. Even bad, even bulging battery issues are a huge headache with them. So if it's something that's put like so squished together, uh, it's, it's this whole move towards like soldering in your RAM and, and your SSD and making your surface uh, two in ones where it's only through Microsoft that they can get repaired. Hey, great Tesla and this whole shift towards that and proprietary repair, but that's not working for our clients. So, right, so, so when you are buying, so number one, that's really important information. I think when you are buying surface, are you buying through distribution? Or are you going direct through Microsoft? How does it work? The last time was through Microsoft. A couple of times in the past, we've gone through distribution. But going forward, I think we'd continue to use Microsoft just from a standpoint of the reliability is one thing, but secondarily, the downside, you know, the 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 rebound. Is there a problem with it? I we do not want to be in a situation where we have to say, well, go to Microsoft. But if somebody's demanding a surface and we can't facilitate the repairs with it, we're putting in between a rock and a hard place. And there's not a real good situation where we're going to be able to meet that customer's needs on back end with it. And back end is one of the reasons where people are reaching out for us. Yeah. So, um, yeah, if, if somebody says to me, I want a two in one or I want a portability or I want a convertible, it's not my first choice. Okay. He also, uh, Krika also then said, carbon system laptops look very stealth and, and surface laptop like. Um, I haven't checked them out. I'm going to go check them out now uh, that everybody's uh, talking about them. But hey, if they have that advanced replacement thing where it's like, oh, we'll just send you another one. You send the old one back. Here's the label. Pretty <laughs> I, it's not a bad deal. I've seen that in quite some time. <laughs> yeah. So they I don't... usually give you a heart, like you got to send it to the depot. They got to evaluate it. They determine it's going to be replaced. And then a month later, you finally got a replacement computer. I think it was Dan from Carbon that was here on Monday. And he was talking about like their ability to put uh, logos on the top so that if you want your organization mm. a personalized aspect, you can get that from them. And I thought that was a cool factor. That it, is slick. I yeah, like that. People will be looking for that level of personalization with it. And um, I mean, that's that's really a big selling point. But yeah, their, their stuff looks great. It's got the right it's got the right uh, pedigree as far as like the engine under the hood. We're hearing this stuff that we want to know about as far as like putting 16 gigs in it, putting uh, the ability for 11 to be put in down the ropes. We're not telling anybody to go through a lot, go to Windows 11 yet. Coincidentally, listening to your show the other day where they're talking about uh, now Microsoft's kind of like, hey, yeah, come on, everybody. Put it There's in. 11, get on the bandwagon. But like nobody's getting on the yeah, bandwagon. Not, not yet. It's so, like not happening. No, not yet. And we need longer support for, for, for 10 because there's going to be so many people, so many of our smaller clients, not even the big ones, the smaller clients are the ones that are going to be reticent to, to, uh, to upgrade because there's just been too many scare uh, stories going out. But yeah, I, to stay and to stay on the 
topic of the day here with carbon. Uh, carbon impressed us with how the stuff looks. And awesome. uh, we're going to have to get some carbon samples sent out, I think. Yeah. Uh, so, guys, I, number one, I can't thank you enough again for helping us out again for the third year to row in the Channel Strong Tour in Chicago area. Uh, appreciate you guys taking an hour out of your day, right? I, I mean, I think it's always good for MSPs to learn from other MSPs, right? Sometimes you don't need to learn it the hard way. And this is how uh, we can do that a little bit. So really appreciate you guys like sharing, right? And like, you know, collaborating a little bit and like f hearing what works and what doesn't work for you guys. And, you know, it's exciting. I, 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 I'm excited, you know, that you're opening up your second office. When's that going in again? Uh, we're, we're just waiting for the door access system to be completed so my staff can get in without needing physical keys, uh, but we're otherwise ready to rock. I mean, I would say it's under a month away at this awesome. point. So. Check, check out Fire Logic online, guys. Hit these guys up on LinkedIn. Ask them questions. They seem pretty open. They might need learn from you. You might learn from them. Welcome to the community. <laughs> Chicago area. You know, again, we, this is a big market here. And uh, again, if you've got opportunities where you need some support or we may need some extra hands for certain things, again, reach out to us. And, you know, we're always uh, looking to network and, um, and and connect with others in our industry. So Awesome. That is that is That is a great perception on the world guys this whole session was recorded so you can rewind and like say hey what did these guys say about microsoft surface stuff and you can like you know fast forward and, and download and all the good stuff there you'll find that at mspinitiative.com under session uh sessions don't forget to check out the channel strong tour coming to the northeast next uh looks like at the end of next month middle of next month so if you're in that northeast corridor definitely come out and hang out and uh hey guys Keep in touch. Uh, Tuesdays, Thursdays, uh, 1 o'clock Eastern. We do these all the time. And watch out. We got more events coming. So we'd love to see you guys out again. Thanks, George. Have a good one, guys. Thanks.